And he's going to there we go. Ladies and gentlemen, hello. Good afternoon. Welcome to Crypto 23. My name is Tony Kay. I am a freelance writer here in the great Pacific Northwest, and I am honored and thrilled to be moderating this panel uh, celebrating the 40th anniversary of a certain little movie about a little guy from outer space and the lovely regular folks who help him out. Each of these folks individually has a more than interesting enough resume to talk to on their own, uh, but we're delighted to have them here to talk about none other than E.T. Please give a very well, well, very warm welcome, excuse me, six hours of sleep, not good, uh, to Dee Wallace, Henry Thomas, and Robert McNaughton. I would like to introduce Mr. Seppi Mays as well. This gentleman here. Oh. Oh. Um, this gentleman did the um, bike stunts. Oh. Uh, oh. Greg, uh, for uh, the character of Greg, played by Casey Martel and uh, Henry. Oh my gosh. Wow. <laughs> Because, you know what, again, now I've got four people who, with resumes interesting enough that I could talk to for an hour by themselves, but, uh, welcome. Hey, How are you guys doing? Thanks for having me. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, Sorry about springing the surprise on you. I, no, I'm delighted. I've you know? never met the gentleman before, but he came to the yeah, table. Yeah, could and... be a total imposter. That's, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know well, he has a photo. He has a Star Wars mythos with that proof. same. Yeah. I was a Jawa once. Really, I was. No, uh, okay, so the set was top secret. We weren't allowed to, like, um, we were only allowed to have one guardian. So, like, Henry couldn't bring both his parents. I could only bring either my grandmother or my father or my mother. So... I was in that for all of them. <laughs> but we weren't allowed to take photos. That was a huge no-no. Like, I, don't, I have one photo, and it's a Polaroid that they took of us on Halloween when we were in costume, and Stephen was wearing a bag lady outfit. Um, oh my God. This gentleman had somebody hiding up in the bushes, taking shots of all of the um, kids on the bikes when they were doing the stunts. I can't tell. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna tell Spielberg you can expect a lawsuit coming from me. Oh, that's it. Well, uh, welcome, and in the case of Dee, welcome back. Thank you. We love having you. You were actually one of my very first panel interviews 12 uh -oh. years ago, so. Uh, I, and it was one of my, it's always been one of my favorites. Did I train movies. you well? You trained me outstandingly. Oh, okay. <laughs> outstandingly. Uh, well, I'd kind of like to start a little bit before the beginning of E.T. and kind of talk a little bit, uh, and actually this would be perfect with you to be as well, uh, but with kind of what, where you were at the point you started E.T. I mean, obviously the two of you were child actors, you accrued a lot of uh, TV work, and, and Henry, in your case, you had, it garnered a lot of attention from Raggedy Man. Um, <laughs> what was and, and Drew had already done four movies. So Henry's one. Yeah, yeah Drew, Drew would four. point that out. Well, she was okay, five. She pointed that out. That was well, the first thing she said to me. She was like, "How many movies have you been in?" I said, "Oh, one." She goes, "Oh, poor thing. I've been in four. <laughs> well, she's not here. It's all about you guys. Um, oh, but yeah, um, Sir Lawrence Olivier. Yeah, Sir Lawrence Olivier. <laughs> So uh, kind of uh, give us a, a picture of what it was like at your, at your respective ages going into the audition pro process for E.T. Uh, you know, uh, you had already experienced working with directors and obviously were kind of showbiz veterans. Um, what was it like leading up to a Steven Spielberg movie? Well, well, I think he was addressing that to you, but... I had a whole, a whole separate... Okay, here we go. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Okay, I was lucky because I missed the preliminary auditions for E.T., which were in Southern California, and I was in New York at the time doing an off-Broadway play. So, this woman, a casting director for another film called The Entity, which I'm sure all of you know for a you know, horror convention. Um, so, they had me come and read for The Entity in L.A. I was a little bit too young for that part, so the woman who was casting that uh, wasn't casting E.T., but she knew who was. She said, I hear they're doing something at Spielberg that you might be right for. She called Mike Fenton, and that's the only way I would have 
known about it or gotten a, an audition. So I, just luck, basically. And, and for me, uh, I, I had just uh, gotten my first professional job the year before, and that was just uh, happenstance. I was in Texas, they were doing casting for Sissy's Basics uh, Sons. And there were two boys in, in the story of Raggedy Men, and I auditioned and got the part of the older son. And because of that, it was a universal picture, and I was kind of on the radar at Universal uh, because Spielberg was looking for a boy to be the lead in the, in the story. So, you know, my name came up, and when I was doing post production on Raggedy Man in Los Angeles, uh, I got an audition and ended up getting a part. And you see his audition, I'm sure, online. Uh, it's amazing. It's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, the considerable amount of the reason the power of that movie is, honestly, the reason we're in this room to, to talk to you about this is because of your work in the film, so it, it, it tracks nicely. Um, D, you were already very well along in your career, and uh, I think you just fresh come off of The Howling when you came out. Yes, I've done The Hills Have Eyes and Ten. Oh, yes. With Blake Edwards, and uh, Stephen saw me in The Howling. He brought me in to audition for used cars. I didn't get it, oh damn. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and then when E.T. came along, they, they called an offer to me. Oh, goody. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goody indeed. And actually, I can direct the question, is, is it Seppi? Seppi, uh, how did you get involved with E.T.? What was your, uh, was there some sort of audition process? How no, there wasn't. Work? I was a BMX racer at our local track in Gardena, California. I lived about three miles down the road. And uh, we were there on a Thursday night, it was a practice night, and that's when they came out and casted us. My neighbor at the time was working for the bike company that was supplied the bicycles to the movie. And he went and met uh, Henry and everybody when they delivered the bikes, and he suggested that they should go out and get real BMX riders to ride the bikes for what has to be done. They showed up, picked us, told us to meet him at a location, we went up there, got $50, <laughs> we were like 14 years old, and uh, the next thing we know, they called us back, said we got the part, and we started filming. And one thing, there was one writer that was in it that played uh, Howell's character. Oh, yeah. I mean, Howell's. Howell's character. And uh, Tyler. Now, that guy was a, a professional BMX rider at the time. He already owned a big uh, BMX company. And at that time, you're talking 81, that was my BMX idol. And like, when we went and did the first test, they go, we need an older guy to do this. Who do you suggest? And I go, get, some, get Bob Harrow, because his, his warehouse was a, like, a mile up from my house. And I used to go hang out in front of his warehouse door, hoping to see him. So I would sit there and wait, wait, and then... My objective was to ride with Bob Harrow on the movie. <laughs> I had no idea what the movie was about at the time. And that's how it happened for me. It was all just timing. Right place, right time. So you were not a showbiz guy. You I just... was not a showbiz, but I was show off. That's a, that's a, that's a very Spielbergian story right, right there. Absolutely. Uh, so once the audition had clinched, uh, I mean, the chemistry is obvious on screen. How, how far into kind of the rehearsal process did you realize that this ensemble was really gelling? When did it feel? The first like? day. Awesome. It's true. I mean, you guys just went, yeah, let's go play basketball. And let's, you know, yeah. go play pinball. And, you know, and oh yeah, now we've got to see it. <laughs> right? So it, they, they just bonded really quickly as a family and of course I'm always a mom so <laughs> I just first week, moved right into taking care of all of them. I, I'm still sort of confused but the first week at Laird Studios um, I think we were already into filming the outdoor sequences in the neighborhood but that first week at Laird Studios we weren't filming it was more rehearsal, a little rehearsal and then sort of um, the photos that you that are on the walls uh, the photos they took of the family and everything you know, 
you know, of us that, that, that you see in the living room, of us on the wall. So it was like that was the time we were getting to know each other. And also, um, we were, it was all in the middle of the school year. So even before we started filming, we were still going to set and going to school on set every day. So all of the kids got to hang out together, in, like en masse, and, uh, you know. And made trouble. And made trouble, but got to, we, got to, we got to know each other and we, we developed, a, you know, a, a, a little bit of a language there. Okay. Yeah, definitely. And we, we had school with the uh, uh, BMX guys too for just a brief period that we were doing some. We didn't do any of our own stunts. We're not Tom Cruise. <laughs> <laughs> All that bike stuff in the movies, not us. So, uh, but we had school with them briefly, the ones that were uh, young enough to be in school. Only one day. One day, got, yeah. We got a little crazy and they separated. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> well, and, uh, and, and the, the thing is that there's a very uh, inbuilt uh, familial element to everything anyway. The, you took the, the, the maternal role quite oh, easily. Uh, did you find yourself lots of these guys any years? Point? Oh, no, no. <laughs> Most of it was, are you okay? This is what we're doing now. Does everybody understand everything? You know, it was... She was great with Drew, I have to say. Like, she really... Um, protected Drew, not that she had to protect her against any kind of um, abuse or anything, but she really t just, she, especially in the scenes when he was dying, she oh was my God. very well, protective see, of First of all, Drew, at, when a kid is like four, they go in and out of reality and fantasy all the time. Yeah, the veil, like the veil hasn't lifted. Uh, uh, your own kids, for example, Go, mommy. How can you be up there and here with me? <laughs> they don't get it. So she really thought ET was real, and we would find her over talking to ET when he was standing in a corner. So Stephen actually had finally assigned two people to keep ET alive, so he could do something in reaction to Drew to keep him alive. So I go in when E.T.'s dying and I say, okay, Drew, now we're gonna go in and E.T.'s gonna be dying, but you know he's just acting like we are. And she said, I know, Dee, do you think I'm stupid? <laughs> so I picked her up and took her in. She took one look at E.T. on that table and went, <gasps> And with Danny and Cujo, I just always tried to make sure they knew what they were doing and that they were safe and all that. <laughs> like any mother does. Absolutely. And Peter, who played Keys in the movie, I have to say, he would show us card tricks. <laughs> she was being very protected, and he was just being of like course. a fun uncle. He would tell us jokes and show us card tricks. Yeah, card tricks, yeah. Well, obviously, Robert Henry, you. We're a bit more sophisticated, discerning than a four-year-old at that time. Uh, but I would imagine there's a fair amount of uh, verisimilitude with working with this real thing, with Carla Rambaldi's costume slash mechanics. I mean, Was it easy is he to get into the reality of the situation this, with this uh, Honestly, I, I had a lot of problems with it because uh, it made a lot of noise. Uh, like all of the servos and everything were constantly going and the eyes, every time we blink, would make a noise. And so I would get, it would take me out of it sometimes. But the thing that really made it real for me was uh, Caprice Roth, who was a mime, who did all of E.T.'s hand movements. So she wore these prosthetic gloves and kind of, uh, you know, in a contorted position, lay underneath the, the lens or wherever she could fit and kind of position her hands to where it looked natural. And, and having that, like having uh, a tactile thing where I could be touched or I could 
see yeah. human uh, movement, it, it really synced it up for me. And then it was easy. I mean, all your scenes were with E.T. Practically yeah. the whole film is, is Henry interacting with E.T. And they made, they swore in the secrecy because he, I think Stephen wanted my reaction when I first see him to be fairly shocked and real. So you'd already acted with him for a week with the actual working model yeah. before I even saw it. And he was, he took it serious. He would not tell me anything about what it was like. <laughs> and, you were very, uh, yeah, I was towing the line. You were towing the line. <laughs> and I, I was, I was towing the corporate line. Just, I just looked at E.T. as another character. I, I remember distinctly coming in the first day on the soundstage, and E.T. was standing there, and there were a bunch of guys around him working on him, doing something, and I stopped in my tracks and just, I don't know, I saw his soul, I saw, I just saw E.T. I, I never, so weird, seems like you, because you were young, you would have done that, but I, I don't know. When I first saw him, I, I thought, wow, that's cool, you know, looks amazing, but then, yeah, you know, I, I was like, it was like the first week, so they were still ironing out a lot of kinks. Yeah. So we had like, you know, the left eyelid would always stick. <laughs> yeah, and that would been, and then, oh, now I want to see the outtakes. You know, yeah. like, they would cut and then we'd do it again, and you know, and then there would be a discussion between Carlo Rambaldi and Steven and everybody else. And, yeah, uh, that was, it, it see, was, I never. And, yeah, I, uh, I didn't either. Stuff, he was walking behind me, or, you know, I'd come into the bathroom and go, what the fuck? <laughs> 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 so I didn't, yeah. Also, there were kinks in the beginning as far as the walking model of E.T. There was the model that had, you know, there was a million dollars it cost for the actual E.T., which was one-tenth of the budget. Um, but, but that model was different from the model when you see him drunk, when um, the scene when um, uh, D opens the door and knocks him over, um, and that that took some doing too because there were several people that that it, was Matthew. It, it ended up being Matthew, but originally they were trying another actor named Pat Bylon, who passed away uh, right shortly after the filming. Was that a little person? A little person who was uh, older and he had some health issues. And they ended up going to UCLA Medical Center and finding this boy, uh, Matt Demerit, who was born without legs. Now Matt didn't like using the prosthetic legs, so he gets he get got around gets around on a skateboard. Most athletic person I've ever known. I, he's unbelievable. And and such a great guy too. Um, he was twelve. So they put him 10. in upside down on his hands and he walked on his hands and that's how we got E.T. So a big part of what you see of E.T. the personality wise is Caprice, it's Matt Demerit, with his very distinctive walk and all the scenes that where you, the scenes you laugh at is Matt doing this to E.T. so we think of Matt as E.T. Um, and that's what's E.T. to us is to, and, and Melissa who wrote the script who provided the heart. Yeah, it wouldn't it wouldn't be here without Well, I, I wanted to ask you, Dee, um, when I talked to you uh, a few years ago, I, I, we had kind of talked about your acting style and how you tend to like to be very much in the moment. There's a you lot think? of... Yes, maybe just a little bit. Um, what? So I was wondering what it was like being on this big, for you, uh, and, and with your, your acting style, how it was being on this very big, very involved, very technically elaborate set. Um, you do a wonderful job of feeling like a very spontaneous, uh, kind of unworked character. You're going through a lot of stuff emotionally, uh, but you're amidst, you know, this big sci-fi blockbuster, basically. How did you, how did you kind of you know, keep your head? I didn't look at it any differently than anything else I've done. I, I really, my technique is my technique. I learned it from my mentor, Charles Conrad, and I never, ever used any other technique. Uh, and basically, you get your energy way up, and you 
throw all your energy to the werewolf or the dog or ET or whatever it is you're working with it. What that does is it opens up a channel. So I just wait for the character to tell me what to do. I just let the character get inside me. That's why when they said penis breath, you know, there's, your reaction is there's priceless. A laugh, yes. You know, and it's it's a real it's a real reaction. You know, if I had thought of that through my head, I would have gone, well, I'm the mother, and I should be stern about that. It's not okay in my head. But the great part is, you you are thinking that, and yet you're still laughing. Yeah. That's the that's the wonderful contrast. And then she's able to recreate it too, because I we did a, a bunch of takes of that, and that wasn't so the only take we did. I don't remember. No, I remember it was because you did it, and Stephen loved it, and then you know the multiple angles, yeah. and you were a, and you have the craft to be able to recreate. Well, when you when you discover the life of the real moment, it's easy to recreate it. You know, doesn't look to, easy. To try and, and find that reality through your head doesn't work for me. Works for a lot of people. A lot of most English actors break everything down. And, you know, That's why it's so boring. That's why they're so boring. <laughs> I just say it I'll say it no all day long. No penis breath. <laughs> 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 One of the things that's always struck me, and I think that really resonates with audiences, is that um, this is a loving but kind of rough around the edges and dysfunctional family. You're going through a lot of struggles, and um, you know the both of you are you know young people growing up to be adults, and uh, it, it feels to me like there may have been a, and I'm sure to all of us, that there may have been a fair amount of growing up happening for the two of you while you were on set and going through this, because this is definitely the biggest project that any of you had worked on up to that point. Yeah, I mean, I, I was I was 10, and I'd grown up in rural Texas, South Texas, so this was the first time that I had been around a, a lot of professional actors that were close to my age or, you know I, I had worked with one kid before and he had never done anything either so um, it was exciting for me and I really didn't know what I was doing like uh, oh yeah. no no <laughs> no I mean honestly like I, well, I keep doing it. yeah keep, keep doing what you don't know how to do please and what was great about Henry was um I'd already been in this sort of the Southern California scene, and you know, there's a lot of actors that worked a lot that uh, were his age and my age that that had sort of forgotten about um, just you know, you're 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 play acting, you're having fun, you're you're this isn't this isn't a competition, you're not trying to one up the other actor, you're not trying to be the showiest, and Henry was just so thoughtful and. Um, and you know, right, right away I liked him because he was, you know, grounded. He was his parents did a great job of grounding Henry, in like this is not real. This is this. You know, he didn't. Ha he wasn't like a Hollywood kid. Let's just say that. that was your question. Is this on? No. <laughs> we can switch the lines, lines on. I can I can play with this here. This. Hi. <laughs> His original question was, did you guys come from a dysfunctional family, basically? And both of you were raised in a pretty functional family, aren't you? I would say, um, I had a brother and sister close to the same age as in the movie. A younger brother and a younger sister. Um, Henry, and you, you were raised as an only child. Yeah, yeah, I was an only child. Um, but, you know, it, a, a stable family. Yeah, I had a stable family, but I Good also, parents. like, I grew up, like, I grew up on a farm, I had responsibilities and stuff, like, I wasn't, I wasn't, like, some kid who was, like, yeah, I'm gonna be a theater kid and do think, something, like, it wasn't ever that, it was always, um, 
you know, I was a weirdo, and everybody in my family knew it, but they didn't know what I was going to do, you know, it's like, it's not like they said, oh, this kid's going to be an actor, you got to get into Hollywood. It, it just, it, it happened, and, and I think my parents didn't really know how to deal with it when it started happening, it was just kind of like, wow, I, I want a ticket on this, uh, you know, wild trip, and it's probably not going to last very long, so enjoy it while it lasts, but don't get, I don't get your head spun out. I came from a very dysfunctional family, and I had a mother, for all practical purposes, was a single mom. My dad was a severe alcoholic who ended up committing suicide my senior year of high school, and I saw my mother uh, God love her. And I, I really didn't realize and don't think I did consciously base Mary on her at all. And I knew her. I knew Mary. I knew the tension she was under. I knew the pressure of, are my kids going to be okay? And that moment when he says he's in Mexico with Sally, just about killed me at that dinner table, which is why I got up and left. It wasn't written in the script. And it really lands emotionally too. Uh, there's a lot of impact of that scene. And I, yeah, I think I think what I was kind of driving at, I'm trying to drive at, not so much the dysfunction aspect, but the the flawed aspect of it. The fact that the fact that these are these are three very real, relatable human beings, and things aren't always hunky dory. And that well, moment. And aren't we all? Yeah, exactly. Aren't we all flawed? Yeah, which is why the movie, again, I will dovetail back to why the movie works so very well emotionally. I think a lot of uh, Dee's character, I mean, I think before we ever got to it, was developed with Melissa and Stephen. If you've seen The Fablemans, you can see what a force of nature Stephen's mom was. And she. You know, I think a lot of that worked its way into the script before we ever even started. That, you know, a lot Maybe, was. Maybe, but that was there. never. They it was never, never told to, to us. It. I only realized that later. Um, but, but your character is like. I mean. Stephen wanted everybody, every adult in the movie, to be a child. And he thought I had the vulnerability of a child. And then, and the only uh, adult you see from the waist up is Mary, for that reason, because she's one. She's she's like a kid interacting with us. I mean, she's she's also sort of vulnerable and like you know being affected by this. And I think that it didn't make sense to me until I saw the Fablemans. But I think that was the, his mom was, had a childlike character as well. So I think that was put into the script and interpreted by you brilliantly, like you cast the absolute right person and then and what you brought to it. Yeah, good casting. One of his many gifts as a director is, is definitely casting. Um, well, uh, Seppi, let's kind of shift this back to you. Um, what was it like being on a movie set? And did, did you work second unit or were you actually working with Spielberg on, on some of these stunt scenes? Second. I didn't work with Spielberg until I did the uh, Halloween crash scene when he went out in Halloween and they flew for the first time and they're coming in for the landing. He's like, please don't crash, please don't crash. I crashed. <laughs> and I think that was the only time I worked with Spielberg. And that was in the studio. Oh, man, go figure. You're one day with the big guy. Yeah, yeah, one day. Um, a couple of the other guys did uh, for Robert. One, his one scene that he did when he went out to go find E.T. And he's like going down the alleyways and uh, the feds are following you. That was a friend of mine named Steve Willerby. And that was one shot, one take, one day. He was gone after that, did it once, which is pretty cool. Um, on, the, on the set, it was a lot of fun because we were just being kids, riding our bikes and getting paid. <laughs> you know, I had no clue what was going on, like what ET was. We had no idea. The bike that I rode with the basket, it was a uh, giant tin can with a foam, foam cushion shoved in it with a blanket wrapped around it. And you're talking, it was maybe like 40 pounds total with a milk crate 
it's steel bars holding the milk crate up there, and I'm like 14 years old, maybe less than 100 pounds, and I gotta ride this thing down the hill, full speed. And it was, it was pretty frightening to me. Oh, you loved it. <laughs> I loved it after the fact. And I still didn't know what it was in the, in, the, in the basket. I didn't find out or see E.T. until the scene you guys filmed where you're in the van and you're about ready to take off. I'm outside leaning against the van and I'm going, what's he talking about in there? Because I was there for uh, being an extra for something. That's the first day I saw E.T. in the back of the truck, in the trailer. And, uh, Still didn't have an idea what it was about <laughs> until way later. And my heart sank because the first week of filming was the scenes around the neighborhood um, with the bikes, but with, primarily with us just riding, like me riding down the driveway and you know stuff like that, but not the bike stunts. But I saw I was so you know it was a Spielberg movie. Close Encounters was my favorite film at that time. Close Encounters was like everything to me. And I show up, and E.T. is in this basket, but it's just like this rubber mask. <laughs> it's because they, they tried it with the actual working model, and it was too heavy. The bike would just fall over with the actual mechanical E.T. So they ended up being just a rubber mask kind of thing, wrapped in a blanket. And I go, oh no, it's going to be this kind of movie. So I, uh, I think everybody who has not worked with Steven Spielberg is very interested in knowing, just kind of getting a really good idea of what his working method was like and what it was like with each of you individually. Could, could you kind of down the, down the line talk about that and start with you on that, Dean? Easy. That's the first word that comes to mind. He was, it takes a lot of talent to direct kids. Because if you actually direct them, they start acting. And so he would throw off, like he'd say, okay, Gertie, take a bite of your hamburger. So she'd be chewing up the hamburger and look at Mary and go, oh, what's an alien or whatever the line was. And he'd throw things off to all of us. I, as an adult, happen to love working that way because I'm in the moment and then stuff just happens. But uh, I, as I watched him direct you guys, I could really appreciate how much he kept you all alive all the time. Yeah, yeah he was always kind of... Uh, with with me during the scenes, he was he was always uh, throwing stuff out there. So, like I, I would learn to deliver my lines in the silent moments, and I would learn to just on the fly change whatever it was that I was doing according to what he was saying. And so there was a lot of, especially in the scenes when. Elliot brings E.T. into his room and he's kind of showing him around and explaining to him uh, what all of these objects are. That was all just, uh, it wasn't it scripted. It, it, was, it was basically, hey Henry, this is great. Okay, what we're gonna do, here's the table. I just want you to go down the table and just, just tell him all about this stuff. Just, just go, you know, and um, and a lot of that stuff was yours, right? A lot of the stuff was Star Wars toys. Yeah. He yeah. would carry them around the set in a little suitcase. <laughs> and a lot of those Star Wars figures were his. Um, yeah. Yeah, so, like, you know, that was an example of, like, a typical day. Because there were always revisions. So there were always new pages. Every morning, when I came in, I would sit down with Melissa Matheson before I went to school, after I was out of makeup, and we would talk about what was happening that day uh, in the scenes. And she would go through it with me, and then I would go to school and come to set uh, when they were ready, and it might be completely thrown out, and there might be something else in there because Stephen had an idea or he wanted to do something else. You know, you, you never knew, so you were always on your toes, and 
it was always kind of um, it was it always kind of felt off the cuff. Like there wasn't a lot of time to sit and dig in. You know. Which is great for kids. Yeah, we would rehearse it's with Melissa. Great for adults too. <laughs> yeah, 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 Stephen. It was great. Uh, Stephen. I think Stephen had full reign to um, not have to be in charge because of Kathy Kennedy. She, Kathy Kennedy was the first movie she produced, and she was just a dynamo. And she says uh, later she she says that she was terrified, and it sure didn't show because she was she just took all the weight of responsibility for anything off of Stephen's shoulders, so he could just be in his head with us and with E.T. and with you know directing. <laughs> so. With us, he was great. You know, we would we were allowed to suggest ideas that he would think it was good or not. You know, and then and keep it. Or Henry's uh, it was Henry's idea that I do the Yoda voice in the movie, which I don't think any other person could get away with because they'd have to, have to pay George. <laughs> he didn't have to. Well, Stephen didn't have to pay George, so this is all. we could talk about Greedo and Hammerhead and all of those guys. Whatever we wanted. Yeah. What what is it? biggest things I was grateful to Kathy and Melissa both were on the set. You know the scene where E.T. brings in the Reese's Pieces and puts them on the bed while I'm asleep? Well, Stephen, oh, maybe I shouldn't say <laughs> Stephen wanted the sheet way down here. And I went, no, Stephen, no, that's, that's not... No, it's not used cars. A family film. <laughs> you know, I, I know in Poltergeist that they were smoking joints and everything, but this is a family film, and frankly, my grandmother will roll over in her grave. <laughs> and he turned it and looked at Kathy and, and Melissa, and they both went, Yeah, we kind of agree. <laughs> so I, I got the sheet up, up to my shoulder blade. <laughs> I was really happy about that. You know, you can take the girl out of Kansas. But you can't take Kansas out of the girl, God. I can't say how rare also that a writer is there every day that you can work with, that the revisions come in and, and you can talk to her and say, um, okay, so this is new, but you know. E.T. wouldn't be E.T. without Melissa. Oh no. In any way, shape, or form. It, 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 yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful screenplay. It's like elegant in its simplicity, and the fact that it, but it also gives a really great framework on which you were all able to work. And so, kind of to piggyback a little bit off of what Dee and Henry have said, what was Robert your direct experience with Spielberg? Was it a lot of improvisation? Was it kind of down the middle? What, I came from a different background, and I think it wasn't something he was necessarily used to. So I wanted to rehearse as much as possible, which, you know, it's not really... Uh, it's, it's more spontaneous in film and everything. I, I came from more directly from just doing a lot of theater. And I had done some television, but I didn't have any experience doing... That was the first film I did. So... Uh, oh my god, I didn't realize that. Yeah, I mean, I've done TV movies. But I did the previous year. I did four TV movies. For, uh, oh well. But, <laughs> but still. But yeah, it was kind of. Um, yeah. For me, it was a little different. But but he related to me on a teenager level. Let's just say that. But we, I felt like very in tune with him, and you know, he he people get nervous about meeting him, and then they, they lose it about a minute in because he's so, you know, uh, he's just Available. always. Yeah, but he's always excited about whatever he's excited about that's like, he, he's so enthusiastic about whatever it is, and it might not be anything you even know about, <laughs> but, so, but it makes you not nervous when you're sort of, you know, that he's, he's it's, it, it, it's a real special quality that I always like to know. Um, you know, sometimes I can't relate, like he would, he would say, to, he'd direct me and say like, pull the hood off, like Richard Basart in Prisoner of Zenda, and I'm like, <laughs> Tell me to do it like Harrison Ford and I can do it. <laughs> but but it was easy to it was easy to relate to Steven as another teenager. That's great. Uh, so uh, at this point, I mean there's plenty more that we could talk about in terms of I think uh, all of your careers. 
but uh, I think what we'd like to do at this point is turn this over to the audience and let you folks kind of do my job for the next 25 minutes. So uh, we'll they, they take questions we and we've got, uh, we've got uh, one gentleman back there. I can actually, uh, I can use the exercise. So I shall be the mic runner. I just had a, a question that I know you have. Can't hear you, baby. Hello? There we go. Uh, hi, Dean. Uh, hi. Mr. Walsh. Uh, I know you have a very extensive body of work in horror, and uh, Henry, I've been watching you in the haunting of the whole house in Blue Manor. I'm sorry, I, I couldn't catch it. I'm sorry. It's a, sorry. Yell into it. Uh, Literally. Yeah, we have noise coming up behind us, too. Sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, I, I've been watching uh, D. Walls for years, and, and I've been watching uh, Hen Henry in uh, the Haunting Hell House in, in Flint, Flint Manor. I was just wondering if uh, you guys are going to collab now that you, you're both in the horror genre, you know, more into the horror horror genre, if you're going to uh, collaborate. And, and, and are we going to collaborate? Yeah, in the horror. I collaborate with Henry on anything. Yeah, yeah, me too. Absolutely. I'd like to see that. That would be fun. Yeah. Uh, someone else? I'm sorry. You know. Oh, shut up! Woo! <laughs> Hello, everybody. I'll talk into it. I'm not shy. Um, it's more of a statement from Robert. Can you, uh, can you swear that I have absolute power? Can you swear? <laughs> Can I swear? Can you swear that I have absolute power? You have absolute power. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to use that with both of you as well. Thank you so much. I, I swear, I think I do that more than Frank Oz. <laughs> uh, and to answer your questions, I will. Uh, another yes. You, over here. On, this is this will date me badly, but I'm feeling very filth on you right now. <laughs> A quick question for all of you guys. So how you guys feel about Mac and me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, how do we feel about Mac and me? I, I think it's great because it gave Jennifer Aniston her, her start in show business. Uh, she's actually in the movie. She's an extra in the McDonald's dancing scene in Mac and me. Uh, so. Only Robert <laughs> would know that. <laughs> To say nothing of what it did for McDonald's. Mac, Mac and me in Flight of the Navigator. Oh, yeah. Two of my favorites. <laughs> Gotta love it. Uh, anyone else? Yes. So this is for D. Uh, you've done The Frighteners, you've done Cujo, you've done E.T. What was the difference between making all three? Because they're all three kind of a different genre. And three great directors, by the way. Yeah, three amazing directors. Joe Dante, Peter Jackson. Um, I think the difference, the different, biggest difference for me was Cujo just about killed me. It just asked me to do so much more physically and emotionally than any of the other, anything else I've ever done. I think it's a crunch. You should have won an Academy Award for that. I've seen it recently. I saw it recently, and it, it's just an amazing performance. It's just, Thank it's you. raw. It's like, it's immediate. It's, she's the whole movie, basically. And Danny Pintaro, oh my God. Thank God for Danny Pintaro. Wasn't he amazing in it? Yeah. Truly. Thank you for that question. Anyone else? Up front. It, it is my favorite movie, by the way. Of mine. Jojo. Yeah, it's a great performance. This is kind of a piggyback on that question. Um, what was your relationship like with the dog and Cujo? <laughs> I'm sending you to Cujo for a minute. <laughs> okay, there were 13 dogs that played Cujo. Oh they were all trained to go after toys. Uh, because you could not overwork them because they would get sick and die, basically. Wouldn't it be 13 dogs? <laughs> um, 
We were never afraid of those dogs. They were so well trained, and we actually had to tie their tails down because they were wagging them all the time. <laughs> it was just a big game for them, all of them. I have a crucial question. I've always been curious. Did Stephen King ever come to the set? Yeah, first day. Wow. Came first day, and then afterwards. He wrote Dan Blatt, our producer, and said, thank God you didn't kill the kid. At the end, I never gave, oh. got more hate me at mail. Oh, yeah. And the book okay. is brutal. The book. Well, tough. But, but... Should have seen it by now. <laughs> <laughs> she scared of dogs. But she wants to watch it because of you guys. Oh, honey. Oh, you have to see it. She's yeah. great in it. Now that you know, they were all like... <laughs> Now you'll be able to watch. You'll, you'll be scared of sitting in a hot car, though, I guarantee it. And we were freezing, by the way. The whole time we were doing it, we were freezing. Okay. Awesome. Just because you brought that up about the book versus the movie for Cujo, yeah. there's a movie called The Mist by Stephen King. And when he saw the movie, he said, I wish I would have done the ending like that. And I'm not going to spoil it, but the ending is much more tragic in the in the movie than the book and he was like i missed it on that he was doing that yeah well we had a whole meeting and i said guys like you can't kill the kid at the end of this half the people coming right. in the 80s would have never yeah. read the book and for me oh. as a theater goer if you killed the kid it or hard. the dog <laughs> but by that time you wanted some something to happen to the dog. That's the magic of the movie. And, and it's one of those few movies that's better than the book in the sense that um, the characters are more fleshed out in the movie. Uh, both yours and Danny's character are more fleshed out than they are in the book. In the book, you know, it's a lot more about the peripheral characters and, you know, the dog. <laughs> the dog is, a, you know, a big part of it is from the dog's perspective in the book. Um, and, you know, so you could... You could kill the kid. There's no way you could kill the kid in the movie. No, no way. No way. Not in my Cujo, anyway. <laughs> Other question for you. Uh, was there anything that didn't make the cut uh, that wasn't in 18 that you thought was interesting or maybe would have taken the movie in a different that direction? That didn't make it into E.T.? Correct, yes. Well, there was a whole scene with uh, Harrison Ford in the principal's office. Uh, that got cut out that was uh, it was the biggest moment for me on set because I, I he, Harrison Ford was my hero from Star Wars and Raiders of the Lost Ark so I got to do a scene with him and that was fun and I was, was so jealous I was disappointed that it wasn't in the movie because he came to school or, you know like I was in school he came in and said I just did a scene with Harrison Ford <laughs> <laughs> but there was a scene I had to there was a great scene um, in the script that um, I think they decided against. I don't, well, I don't know why they decided against it. I'm not going to speculate. But it was a scene at the very end after we say goodbye to ETA. And, and, and it's a recreation of the scene in the beginning when we're playing Dungeons and Dragons. And he's trying to get our attention. He wants to play with us. And we're just sort of giving him the cold shoulder. But now he's gotten this, this self-assuredness. And he's running the show. He's the dungeon master. And he's... Um, you know, in charge, sort of. He's, he's come into his own, and then it pans out, at least in the script it was described as it pans out over the roof, and you see the communicator on the roof talking to E.T. So I thought that was a real neat touch. And that was the original, that was the original script. Oh, I, like the, I like our ending better. <laughs> yeah. You see, why they, you see why they did it. Once yeah, the it score, sense. once they added the score, I think that you, you just can't, oh. where can you go from there? It's the, yeah. One of the final shots is you look, it's just gorgeous. You looking up at the spaceship and it's just got the whole the whole audience is with you and you know literally yeah. literally had ten minutes to do that scene. Do you remember that that they yeah. pulled me in at the last yeah. minute? And, yeah, because it Come on, we gotta get lunch. We gotta get to the shop before lunch. I went, okay, what are we doing? <laughs> it's a wonderful moment. Um, and then with the score also, I've seen it with the uh, they have it sometimes tour the country with an orchestra. And you get to that part, and that part's when the guy's beating the bass drum. <laughs> it's, it's, it's incredible. To see it with a live it's incredible. It's unbelievable, you guys. Yeah. 
And, and there was also a Michael Jackson song that, was, that he wrote for the movie that was supposed to come up right after that big moment. And how can you not have just the music of John Williams ending the movie? So, you know, that, you know, that was bold, too, Neil to Diamond. not use Michael Jackson, the year of Thriller, you know. Neil Diamond wrote one, Turn On Your Heart Light. That yep. was really actually, actually, Neil Neil Diamond performed it, but Burt Bacharach wrote that song. Oh, well, really? Yeah, it was Burt Bacharach that wrote that song. Oh, I did not and, see. And I always learned something in these things. <laughs> uh, another question over Henry, you just did a commercial that you revisited the world of E.T. What did that feel like, revisiting everything? Well, you know, <laughs> that is like, um, that's what's called a, a late career cash grab. <laughs> yeah, we were I'm still waiting for mine. Uh, anyone else? That's called oh, a pension. Uh, that's called I don't have my pension. Uh, this one's for Henry. Uh, uh, for uh, how'd you get into working with Mike Flanagan, and which of the series was your favorite? Uh, my favorite was Haunting of Hill House. Um, but I've recently done another show with him that's my favorite that's not out yet, which is Follow the House of Usher. Because I, I really like my character in that. Uh, and it was a lot of fun. Wonderful. But I started working with Mike. I auditioned for him in 2014 for the role of Father Tom in, in Ouija, Origin of Evil, which was a prequel to the Blumhouse movie that he did, Ouija. Which is, I didn't think was very interesting, and I went in to meet with Mike, and Mike seemed like my biggest fan. Like he knew everything that I had done, and he just wanted to talk about stuff. And I thought, oh, this guy is just bringing me in to meet me and talk to me, uh, but he's not going to cast me in anything. You know, it's just like a uh, oh hey, uh, really wanted you, really wanted to meet you. Maybe we'll put him in something. But anyway, it turned into him uh, consistently hiring me. Uh, you know, which has been great. It's been a lot of fun, and I think he does a lot of interesting work. There seems to be a terrific working relationship there, and he gives you great roles. Yeah, I, there, it, it just well, and also I think like Spielberg. He's very good with actors and very good with kids, uh, and yeah, they're just. He's also building an ensemble. I think is a great thing. You know, a lot of it, the same actors come back. Yeah, yeah, he does that quite a bit, um, or ha has done, in since since I've been working with him. It's like Rob Zombie. Yeah, he yes. keeps bringing his stable of people back. Well, Mike, you know, the thing about Mike is that he. He has a real love of film and a real uh, passion for it, and he really likes actors. So he will remember a performance from something that he's seen, you know, and he'll he will be uh, adamant about getting that person and bringing them in to this world that he's in. So. He's kind of an anomaly in that if he believes in you as, as an actor, you know, he'll, he'll just put you in there somewhere. And that's been really great for me um, because I think he likes, he likes testing my versatility and he likes to put me in things that um, might make people think one thing, but the character is completely different. And, uh, so, as an actor, it's been fun. Yeah, as an actor, you're always looking, could I do something else? <laughs> my favorite thing with, that he did with, well, not, I, I love The Haunting of Hill House, but there's one episode of Haunting of Bly Manor where you're playing two characters, and very different characters, and I love that awesome. episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that, was, that was fun, thank you. That was, And that's an example of him pushing you, maybe, you know, more than 
<laughs> you ever have been pushed before? Well, I, absolutely. Like I, I thought it was really cool that he gave me an, an English character because as Americans, you know, British people play Americans all the time, and all of their accents always sound like this. They're always like from Southern California because they only talk to their Asians. So, uh, <laughs> Like all, the, all the British actors, like when they're speaking in American English, it's always like this. You know? um, Australians are better at American accents than British. I yeah, they are. for the most part. But, to be, but, the, but according to the according to the Brits, they are the best at accents. No according to the Brits, they're the best at acting. They're the best at acting. Just leave it at that. Or even I'm not now, British. I just wasn't born there. Everybody can come over here and do our roles. And we can't go anywhere else. They're, they're allowed to have one American, in, for the BBC at least. I did a production, I did a production that was all Americans. It was supposed to be Americans, but yet they're only allowed to hire one SAG actor for a BBC production. And, um, and on the one I worked on, I was it. And the rest were British actors playing Americans. Yeah. Are you have one more time for it's one time more question and actually this gentleman had his hand up first? All right, just to bring it back to E.T. at the end here, we all love the film, of course, and I just want to know, um, for the three of you, what's one thing that you hope people will take away from the film? You know, what the, one thing that you hope people can take away from just the whole, the whole film, a theme, anything that means something to you? I, I want them to take away the message of love. That's what I want. That's what the whole world needs right now. The message of ET, keep your heart open. Trust your friends. Know where you want to get to. And go be happy. You know, we've heard it for so long since Peter Pan and before. That's what I want. Go live love. That's what I want. You yeah. can't talk that. You can't talk that. <laughs> and, uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Would you echo those sentiments? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it's about compassion, really. And, um, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. And, uh,. Well, I think that's probably as good a time as any for us to... Oh, we have, do you have a question? Yeah, sure. Well, oh, thanks. Yeah, yeah. Like a All right. Call. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, here we go. So you're <laughs> Guys, if you guys want to bunch up, we're trying to get... Thanks very much. Thank you. Come on in. Everybody say E.T. E.T. E All right, um, thank you, Andrew, for being here. Thank you, Kevin, James, Robert, Seth, Thank you all very much for being here and sharing your memories. Have a great rest of the Crypticon, folks. Please visit our uh, guests at their booths.